Today we're focusing on the latter prophets. You will remember that in our class we are uh, taking the, the Jewish approach to the scriptures, which means rather than think in terms of historical books, um, we are breaking the uh, prophets up according to the way the Jewish Bible breaks them up. Last week we looked at the, what are called the former prophets, which are the more historical prophets. That would be Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. This week, we're going to the second section in the Hebrew Nevaim, or the Hebrew prophets, as, as uh, listed in the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. And that's the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then in the Hebrew Bible, it is the book of the Twelve, the Twelve, what we call minor prophets, and we're going to talk about that. Um, so what is a prophet? I want to talk for a few minutes about the task and role of a prophet. Last week we talked about history in the Old Testament because the books from Joshua to uh, 2 Kings are all books of primarily history. As we discussed last week, it's not history as we tend to think of it in the uh, Western sense. That didn't really start being written until about the 5th century with the Greek writer Herodotus who wrote the history of the Persian Wars. So a chronological, rather objective, uh, oriented approach did not occur until well after the writing of the, uh, the Old Testament. Actually, Malachi, the last book written in the Old Testament, was written right about the time as Herodotus. But most of the Old Testament books are not history as we understand it, but the former prophets are more historical in that they are more concerned with recording facts. Right. But a prophet, by an Old Testament definition, would be one who speaks for God and interprets God's will to the people, which may or may not involve telling the future. As I've said several times, most Westerners, most, most people in our culture, think that a prophet is somebody who tells the future. That may be part of it, but that's not actually what a prophet is. A prophet is one who speaks for God. And that's why, particularly in these latter prophets, when we get into them, these are the prophets who are very much, thus saith the Lord, or this is what the Lord says. Because they are not there to deliver their own message, they are there to deliver the message that God has given them to give to the people. And so that really is a definition of our prophet. Whether it involves in somehow predicting the future or telling what's going to happen in the future by vision from God or not, doesn't really matter. A prophet is one who speaks for God to his people. The first prophet first true prophet, according to that definition, would have been Moses. Because it was Moses who was called by God and whom God said, go to my people Israel and tell them this. Moses is not the first prophet by the Jewish record or, I mean, we think of um, Abraham having been a prophet. In fact, he's called a prophet at one place. Uh, there are others who are pre-Moses who were prophetic in some regard. But in terms of God especially calling someone and saying, okay, your job, the thing I'm assigning to you, is for you to go and tell my word, my will to the people. Moses really was the first one who did that. And in fact, Moses is identified in Deuteronomy as being the prototype for all prophets who will come after him. And that's from Deuteronomy 18, verses 17 and 18. It says, the Lord said, I will raise up for them, that is the Israelites, a prophet like you, he's talking to Moses, from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I commanded him. Now from that point, which is uh, around the mid-1400s BC, on, for the next thousand years, we have a series of prophets who come along, following Moses in the style of Moses, who speak God's will and God's word to the people. The early ones were primarily interested in recording the, his, uh, the histories or the historical events, which are the former prophets. Today we look at the thus saith the Lord kind of prophets, which are the latter prophets. Um, I, I need to say as well that the, the prophet Samuel, Samuel of course as you will remember uh, is, was the last of the judges, because he was identified as a judge. He also is identified as the first of the prophets of the nation of Israel. I say the nation of Israel because you will remember that Judges was the time when uh, Israel had entered the Promised Land, but they really hadn't gotten organized as a nation yet. They were still kind of independent tribes, and in order to address the problems that those tribes had, uh, there were various uh, 
opposition forces that came against them, you know, the, the Philistines, the Midianites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, what, whatnot. And so God gave judges to help deal with those problems in different areas for these different groupings of the Israelites. But they were not yet a nation. Samuel was the last of those judges, but he also was the first of the modern prophets, that is, the prophets of the nation of Israel, because it was Samuel that got anointed to first select the king, Saul, the first king over the united monarchy, the first, the first king that made Israel, instead of being a bunch of tribes that were all related to each other, to turn them into a nation. So Samuel was the prophet that got appointed to go and find Saul and anoint him. It was Samuel that God then sent to tell Saul, you have you've broken faith with me, you have violated my will, and therefore I'm going to cut you off from the kingship. And Samuel, who then went and identified and anointed David. So in that regard, Samuel was both the last of the judges and he was the first of the prophets in the sense of prophets as we think about it, uh, the, of the nation of Israel. Let me talk a little bit about the prophetic office and why it existed. And it's related to this passage in Deuteronomy 18, where Moses is identified as a prophet, and that all prophets after him would be in the same mold, in the same type as Moses. When God called Abraham and said, if you, if you follow me, you will be my guy, I will be your God, you will become a great nation, I will bless all nations through you, and I will give your people a land to live in, the land of Canaan. From that point on... God had a, a plan for his people. That plan grew as the nation of Israel, as the people, I'm sorry, as the Hebrew people grew under Abraham, as he had Isaac and Jacob, as they multiplied in Canaan, they went into uh, Egypt and were there under the protection of uh, Joseph. They kept growing and growing. All along, God's plan was for the people of Israel to be his special possession that they would be, as we're told in, uh, in, the, in Exodus, the kingdom of priests, a holy nation among all the nations. That was God's plan for Israel. Now, in order for that to happen, the Israelites had to follow the instructions God had given them. They had to worship God alone. They had to be prepared to eventually become the light to all the nations, which God had promised. So in order for God's will, his big plan to work out, the Israelites had to pay attention. They had to stay on track. They had to worship God. Well, human beings being what they are, they kept wandering off from that. And so in every case, God corrected them and tried to bring them back in line by sending a spokesperson. He sent a messenger, if you will, a human messenger, not an angelic messenger. And those were the prophets. One after another, the prophets come along in order to remind the Israelites of what God's intention is for them to be a holy priesthood, a special nation, His prize possession in all the world so that eventually they would become the light that would give God's will and under the understanding of God to all peoples. Now, as they fell away, they fell away sometimes in very broad ways, and God would send a prophet that would get a very broad message. There are other times in which there were specific problems that arose that God would send specific prophets to address just that problem. In particular, when we talk about the latter prophets, there are two big categories in that. There are the major prophets and the minor prophets. They are not major and minor in any sense in which one's more important than the other, but the major prophets are the ones with really long books. All right? The major prophets of the, of the latter prophets are uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Isaiah is one of the longest books in the whole Bible, 66 chapters. And so they were major in terms of big messages, broad scope, long books. The minor prophets are much shorter, as short as one chapter. The longest, the, the three longest minor prophets are only 14 chapters. And they were intended to address a much more specific problem at a specific place and time with regard to the Israelites. Uh, you get a condemnation of Edom, for instance, in Obadiah, which is only one chapter. A very specific kind of thing. So you... Um, you recognize that, that they're all important, none of them are less important than the others, but that the major prophets were longer and had a bigger scope in what the, God gave them as a message. And many of them served for a longer period of time, you know, 40, 40 to 50 years in some cases. And the minor prophets tended to be fairly isolated in their message, very targeted in their theme, and most of them, 
uh, you'll notice when we get to that, um, we had just one year as a date where we think it would, because it all happened kind of at one time, they were addressing one isolated kind of instance. I think it's important to recognize, too, that when we talk about somebody having a prophetic message, you know, what's the connotation of that? Everybody always thinks that's gloom and doom. You know, it's, it's negative, it's harsh, it's judgmental. Well, sometimes it was, because frequently the message that God gave to his prophets to give to the Israelites was one of, you're messing up, and you better straighten up. But there are also times where the prophetic messages that were given through the prophets, especially the latter prophets, were um, promises of fulfillment of what God had said would be his blessing on his people. For instance, Isaiah, the longest of the prophets, 66 books, is the book that we know of as being the most prophetic about the coming of Jesus. All of the scripture verses we use at Christmas time. If you were here on Sunday and heard me preach on that, I read a couple of them. All of the ones about a child will be born and a virgin will, will bear a child. And all, you know, so many of these passages we have about the coming of the Messiah, of God's fulfilled promise, of God's blessing, of God's making Israel what he had always wanted them to be in terms of a place of blessing. Those are the messages of the prophets too. And so sometimes the message is doom and gloom. Sometimes the message is God's blessing is just waiting for you to claim. It's, and God wants to bless you. And most often, it's both. It's a declaration of God's doom and gloom and judgment, but the promise that if you repent and turn, then God wants to bless you, and He is there to bless you, and He will be available to you in that regard. Okay? Now, the word prophet comes from the Hebrew word uh, navi, the plural of which is nevaim, you guys remember where we get the, the name Tanakh for the, the Hebrew Bible? It's a combination of three words. Torah, which is the law or instruction, is the first section of the Hebrew Bible. The second section is Nevaim, which means the prophets. The singular is uh, Navi. And then the third is Ketuvim, which is the writings. Torah, Nevaim, Ketuvim. The three of those put together in abbreviation is Tanakh. So the middle one, Nevaim, is a plural of the Hebrew word for prophet. Sometimes the prophets in the Bible are also called um, seers because frequently they, they either saw into the future or they saw clearly the will of God as he revealed it to them and they shared it. They are sometimes referred to simply as men of God, of watchmen because they were responsible for watching the nation of Israel and communicating God's will to them. Sometimes they are referred to as messengers of Yahweh or even just as men of the Spirit. So there are a number of different references, but the most common one, Navi, means a prophet. It literally means one who is called, because a prophet was one who was called by God. In fact, if, you, if we look at what the characteristics are of the Old Testament prophets, frequently it involves first an ecstatic kind of experience. Ecstatic meaning that, that they were taken over, to some extent, by God telling them, I've got a special assignment for you. And here's a message which you need to go and tell. And you get a sense in a number of places that they almost didn't have a choice. You know, that's the ecstatic part. That they really were, the burden was on them to go and share this message that God had given them with the people. Um, a second aspect, which is true to the name prophet to be called, is a call of God. You know, that they, they really did have a sense in which this was their purpose in life. This was their assignment. And thirdly, their character. Prophets are always identified as being people who are holy in character. And God used holy people, righteous people, to fulfill his will through the prophetic role. So those are some of the characteristics we have. Um, let's talk about sort of the series of prophets that we have. And I want to do this in kind of a time, a, a historic timetable so you get a sense of the flow. The first prophets though, are those that came prior to Samuel. Um, we have in Scripture the description of prophets of the prophets Enoch, for instance. Abraham, as I said earlier, is identified as a prophet. Not a prophet in the sense in which he was given a message to take to the Israelite people, uh, but he was God's spokesperson, and he was mostly going to be speaking God's will through his own family. But you have Enoch, who is referred to in June 14. Uh, June 14. Abraham, Moses, the greatest of all the prophets, the prototype or archetype for all the prophets to come. You have Miriam, Moses' sister, who is identified as a prophetess. She spoke God's word in Exodus 
You then have a group of prophets, Eldad, Medad, and the 70, from uh, the book of Numbers, the 11th chapter, and then Deborah, another woman, who's, who was one of the judges, who was identified as a prophetess, one of the, one of the best and coolest of the judges, um, and we read about her in Judges 4.4. 4. So these are prophets that came before Samuel. Samuel really does become the sort of line of demarcation, because any, anybody before him was before the creation of the nation of Israel. And Samuel was the point at which God used Samuel to call forth the kings to create the monarchy, which was the nation of Israel. So he really is a dividing line. So then you get the prophets that are, uh, bit, are during the combined monarchy. The first, of course, of which is Samuel. Samuel, as I said, was called by God since childhood. He grew up in the temple because he was a gift to his mother for having, um, having been faithful. And by the way, is Michael here? Michael Whitehead? Michael asked me the question um, last week or week before, I think it was last week, was Samuel a Levite since he grew up in the temple and Samuel was both priest and prophet? Um, and the question was, was he a Levite? Well, he's identified as being the son of a man who was a, from Benjamin, but the, the suggestion is that there were Levitical cities in different places, so the idea is that he probably was a Levite who was not in actual, there were too many Levites for them all to be actively involved in serving the temple, and yet they still were the tribe of Levi, and so they didn't have large pieces of property like the rest of the tribes. So the suggestion is, they came from an area that's identified as one of the other tribes, but that he probably was from a Levitical family. So that's why he grew up to become a priest. Um, so Samuel, priest and prophet, the one who anointed uh, Saul, who then deposed Saul at God's command and then anointed David and started really the monarchy. We then have a reference to a prophet named Gad that we don't know a lot about. And then we have Nathan. Nathan the prophet was the one who was prophesying during David's time. Um, do we have a chair back there for, for her? Okay. Um, Nathan is the one who confronted David after David's sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah the Hittite. Where... You know, he told the story of a man who stole the land from a, from a rich man who stole the land from a poor man. So that was Nathan the prophet. Then you get Ahijah uh, from 1 Kings 12, and then in 1 Chronicles, Asaph, Heman, and Jaduthan, and then Edo in 2 Chronicles. We don't know a lot about them. We don't have a lot of details, but they are identified by name as being prophets. Now the thing about this, almost every one of the prophets at that point had the responsibility for, for being a counselor to the king. That's why you see Samuel relating directly with Saul and then later with David. That's why you see Nathan relating to David. Because once the kings had been anointed, um, the, the desire apparently of God was that if the kings were righteous, then they would lead the people in righteous directions. But after the combined time of the combined monarchy, um, that all falls apart, and the prophets stop being responsible uh, directly to the king, and instead start prophesying to the wider uh, population, almost as though God said, okay, the kings are not following me, therefore they're not going to lead the people the way they should, so I'm going to send my prophets to speak directly to the people. It's also true, by the way, that you, um, we have two broad categories of the uh, of prophets. The first ones, which are both the, the prophets up through the combined monarchy and then into the divided monarchy, you have prophets who are called non-writing prophets or oral prophets. You will notice that we don't have books named after any of these people with the exception of Samuel. We believe that Samuel probably was the author of Judges of First and Second Samuel, but we consider those prophetic books rather than the sort of thus saith the Lord kind of prophecy books. Um, or historical books rather than thus saith the Lord kind of prophetic books. You will notice that the great prophets like Elijah and Elisha, as great as they were, they did not write any books. Um, during the divided monarchy, which is when, after Solomon, when we, the kingdom of Israel split in two, the northern kingdom, which continued to be called Israel, confusingly enough, and the southern kingdom called Judah, there's a whole series of prophets to try to keep them um, on the straight and narrow to try to communicate to them directly from God 
what his desires still are for them. Uh, we've got a list of the names up here. Many of them you probably have never heard. You probably have heard of Jehu, if you've read it all. There's a wonderful passage that, uh, about Jehu, who ended up taking it upon himself by God's direction to kill some of the bad you know, kings in the family and to take over. And apparently he was a chariot driver and he drove like a madman. In fact, there's an expression, drive like Jehu, and there was a, a rock group, a musical group, called Drives Like Jehu. All right? It's a very cool story. Uh, then you get two of the great prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. But again, they were non-writing prophets. They were oral prophets. They were written about in the historical accounts, but we do not have any direct writing from them. Then Micaiah, Jehaziel, and Eliezer, then Zechariah, and then we have a couple of references to unnamed prophets. So these were prophets which, again, uh, this is the time in transition when, to some extent, they were talking to the kings, but they were also beginning to prophesy directly to the people. All right? uh, you get the conflict between Elijah and the um, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and how he was, he was uh, prophesying to them and trying to straighten them out. But at the same time, we're beginning to see that change and realizing that they weren't going to listen to God. He begins to deal directly with the prophets of Baal and offering prophecy to the people directly, not just commenting to the kings. All right? So that takes us into like the 10th and 9th century, the time of the divided monarchy. 10th century, very simply, would be around uh, the 1,000 year mark. Okay, that's what David, so that's what Samuel would be. And then following up through the 9th century. That was the time of the non-writing prophets. Then we get to the time where God not only is having prophets now speak directly to the people, their prophecies are to the people, no longer to the kings, but they also start being called to write stuff down so that we have books that are called, like the 8th century prophets, Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, and Obed. Obed, we don't have a book named Obed, but he's referred to in, in 2 Chronicles. These are the prophets that God brought along to be more specifically, I mean, again, it was a little bit advising of the kings, but more and more they're, they're leaving that behind. They begin to preach directly to or prophesy directly to the people. Um, and that's, that occurs during this time. Most of the prophecies in this time are to the nations of Israel in the north, the northern kingdom of Israel, or the southern kingdom of Judah. There's also some prophecies either to or regarding some of the Gentile nations. So, and we're going to look at a couple of outlines here in a minute that's going to list a little bit of that. Um, these uh, writing prophets, it's, not, it's actually not completely accurate to say oral or unwriting prophet, non-writing prophets and writing prophets. We actually have some of the prophecies from earlier. Like I say, Samuel, we believe, wrote uh, probably three books of the Old Testament. We also have record of things like Nathan's rebuke to David, which was written down. He may not have written it, but we have writing from, from that time, uh, as well as some of the discourses that Elijah made against Ahab and Jezebel. So it's not a strict divide, but it's a pretty good idea. We don't have books of the Bible, as I said, from Elijah, called Elijah or Elisha, or any of those prophets as well. But in every case during this time, during the split kingdom, especially because the northern kingdom of Israel had no good kings. There were no kings in the northern kingdom of Israel that really followed God. There were a few in the south, which is why the southern kingdom of Israel lasted for about 140 years longer before God's judgment fell on them. But you have these prophets who are beginning to say to the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, you have forgotten God. You are worshiping other gods. You are not obeying the law that he gave. You come back to him. Sometimes very, very strongly, very harshly. Of course, the northern kingdom, who had no good kings, was destroyed by Assyria in 722 B.C. 722 B.C., the north is destroyed. The south, right after that, because Assyria destroyed the north, the south, King Hezekiah, who was a really good king, Assyria, went, you know, went on down the interstate to the southern kingdom of Judah and assaulted uh, Judah to destroy it. And the Assyrian army is camped outside Jerusalem, and Hezekiah refuses to give in. He refuses to, to surrender. And it looks like the city is going to be under siege until it's destroyed, as has happened in so many other places, including the city of Samaria, which was the capital of the northern nation of Israel. 
And yet, while they're camped outside, apparently a plague struck them. God sent a plague, and so many of the, of the Assyrian soldiers died that they gave up and went home. And as I mentioned before, I think the, the official records, the Assyrian records, which we have access to, say that uh, there were other demands back home in Nineveh that, uh, that Sennacherib had to go back and deal with. So they turned around and went back home for that reason. Okay? So the south lasted for quite a bit longer until after Hezekiah, his son Manasseh turned completely back against God, started worshiping other gods, destroyed uh, so much of, the, of what his father uh, and some of his other ancestors had tried to put in place, and eventually led to the destruction of the South as well. And we have prophets during all that time. Okay, So the 8th century would be the 700s. You all know that, right? Okay, 8th century is the 700s, 7th century is the 600s, etc. So the 8th century would have been the 700s. That is when the northern kingdom is destroyed. Of that list that you have up there, uh, two of them, Amos and Hosea, were prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel. All the rest are prophesying to Judah. It's almost as though, except for those two prophets, God had sort of decided that they've never had a good king, and the whole time they've been at this, they have turned so completely away from me. We have Amos, who was actually from the south, he was, he was from Judah, prophesying as a foreigner to the north. And you get Hosea, who was from the northern kingdom of Israel, prophesying, but neither one of them were listened to. We'll get into that a little bit more uh, later on. So that's the time, the 8th century prophets, is the, is the century, 722, when the northern kingdom is destroyed. Then we come to the 7th century, the 600s. This is after the fall of the northern kingdom. We have a series of prophets, all of whom were writing prophets, so we have books by that name, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah, who uh, did prophesy to the southern kingdom. They wrote their prophecies down in an effort to try to keep the southern kingdom of Judah from getting the same judgment and going the same direction that the northern kingdom had. And of those, one of them, Jeremiah, is one of the three major prophets. In fact, if I go back, you'll notice that of the 8th century prophets, Isaiah, here on that list, is considered a major prophet. Some people have Isaiah down in, in two or even three places, and we'll talk about why that is a little bit later, because Isaiah is a, quite a miraculous book, and people don't know quite how to deal with it sometimes. So sometimes Isaiah is put in 8th century, and in 7th century, and sometimes he's put in the 6th century, all at the same time. We'll talk about the, multiple, uh, the uh, alleged multiple authorship of Isaiah in a few minutes. So during the 7th century, uh, we have the prophets who are prophesying to the southern nation of Judah, return to God, be obedient to Him, and God is using them to communicate that message. We then get down to um, the 6th, this 7th century prophets cross over into the 6th century. The 6th century is when the southern kingdom of Judah finally suffers the fall, a fall to the Babylonians because of their failing to be obedient to God. That's in 586. So the northern kingdom of Israel fell to Assyria in 722. Over the next 140 years, Assyria declined in power, and Babylon, the, the empire of Babylon, the Babylonians, arose. They were from right next to each other. The Assyrians and the Babylonians were both from Mesopotamia. The Assyrians in the north, the Babylonians in the south. So. Uh, after conquering the northern kingdom of Israel, failing to conquer the southern kingdom of Judah, Assyria declines in power, Babylon comes up in power, and then God uses Babylon, or the Babylonian Empire, to bring judgment on the southern kingdom of Judah in 586. So that takes us into the 6th century. You get the 6th century exilic prophets, or the prophets of the exile, because when Babylon defeated or, or conquered or destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah, they took the Jewish people off into exile. But unlike the Assyrians, as I've talked to you about before, the Assyrians did a really good job of spreading the people that they conquered out, making them intermarry with other people, and therefore causing them to lose their identity. 
which is where we get the ten lost tribes of Israel. They were the tribes who were in the north that the Assyrians did a brilliant job of, of erasing from history. The two southern tribes, Babylon had a different strategy. Babylon had the approach that they want to take as much advantage as they can of this people who seem to be well educated and well, well cultured. They've got bright young people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they took large numbers, they left some behind to take care of the land, but large numbers of the Jewish people, after they conquered them in 586, they actually took them to Babylon and kept them all intact. Which is why in, this, in the book of Daniel, you have the stories of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego asking to be able to eat their own food instead of the, the Babylonian food and they're given permission to when they can prove that they'll be healthier. They're allowed to maintain some of their own, you know, they have problems, you know, they don't want to worship the king's the idol and therefore they get in trouble. But for the most part, they retain their identity. That's the Babylonian exile. Whenever you hear about the Jewish exile, or the exile period, the exilic period, the period of, you know, they're talking about the Babylonian exile. Because that's the one they came back from. The Assyrian, being conquered by the Assyrians, wasn't an exile because it's not like they left and came back. They never came back in the north. The nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, was never reestablished. The southern kingdom of Judah was. Because while the Babylonians kept them intact, Babylon ended up being conquered by another uh, empire, Persia, which is further east from them. All of this is coming from, from Mesopotamia and just east of Mesopotamia. When the Persians conquered, they allowed, Cyrus the king of Persia allowed the Jews to go back. And that's where you get the stories of Zerubbabel, the governor uh, of Ezra rebuilding the temple, of Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem. All that happens because they were allowed to come back into the Persians. During that exilic period, you get Ezekiel and Daniel are two of the primary prophets who are prophesying while the Jews are actually in exile. Now, I list Daniel here because um, he's well known and he's in the American or Western version of the, the book, the order of books, it includes Daniel as a prophetic book. In the Jewish uh, pattern, he's not called a prophetic book, he's under the writings because there's lots of styles and different kinds of things going on in Daniel. Some of it's history, some of it's prophecy, some of it's apocalyptic literature. Because it's, it's such a combination of so many different things, the Jews put it in a special category under writings. Right? But I listed it here because Daniel was during this time period, 605 to 538, it was uh, his time period, though he's not listed as a prophet in the Nevi'im, in the Jewish lists of prophets. Okay. Questions about any of that? Two questions. Sure. First, Asaph. What, the, you, you mentioned him as a prophet. Was he the guy that did part of the Psalms? Uh, yes. Saying that. His name is listed. It's, uh, there are Psalms of Asaph. Okay. The second question is, um, wouldn't wouldn't Jeremiah be in, listed in the sixth century at exile prophets because well, he he lived during that time. He uh, I don't know. His period of prophecy is, is leading right up to it. Um, Jeremiah's theme was, he was like the last one to say, Judah, you either get your act together, or you're really going to, you know, you're going to take it in the teeth. But if you do get your act together, then God will bless you. So, in fact, you'll notice that his actual time of prophesying, 626 to 586, that 40-year period, leads right up to the time of the Babylonian conquer. But he lived okay. into that. He yes, he did. In he lived into the exile. But his, but his message okay. was different. In fact, this, with the exception probably of Daniel, because, you know, Daniel, the, the book of Daniel, for instance, starts when Daniel is a very young man, when he's taken into exile, and it continues through until he's a very old man. Four so, or you know, we have his whole thing there, because he's a, when he sees the, you know, the, the handwriting on the wall, kind of all that kind of stuff, he's quite old by then. So the book of Daniel covers a long period of time. But the 6th century, Ezekiel primarily, Daniel, although the Jews don't call him a prophetic book, those were the writers during the exile when they actually were in Babylon. Then, as I told you, when um, the, the Persians conquer the Babylonians and Cyrus allows the people to go back to Israel, allows the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild first the temple and then the wall of Jerusalem. 
we have Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi coming along as the last prophets in order, the last prophets in the historic time period, Malachi being in the 400s. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets, unless you count John the Baptist as an Old Testament prophet. John the Baptist was certainly in the style of the Old Testament prophets, but he's 400 years later, and we read about him in the New Testament. But he was of a style of the, the thus saith the Lord kind of prophets. So Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, and Haggai, for instance, is entirely about um, you guys get your act together and finish the temple, because that's the time when they actually have gone back to, uh, to Israel. Now, any questions about any of that? It's a lot, and we're going to break that down a little bit right now, but I wanted to give you a broad overview first. Um, the whole thing is... God speaking first to the kings and saying, during the, the monarchy, combined monarchy, and saying, you're responsible for making sure the people follow me. The kings And the prophets go to the kings to tell them that from God. The kings fail at that, and so the monarchy is split as a judgment against Solomon, who, who started out so wise and so, so pleasing to God and ended up so horrible, allowing child sacrifice right outside the city of Jerusalem. Um, that the kingdom is split in two, and then God sends prophets to speak to those kings for a while. That doesn't work. So he sends prophets to speak to the people of the north, uh, Amos and Hosea, and mostly to the southern kingdom of Judah. The north is destroyed by Assyria because they won't listen. The south eventually is destroyed by Babylon because they, yeah, they, they're on and off and finally fall off the wagon and get destroyed. Then when... The people are in exile in Babylon. God doesn't want them to forget him since they no longer are in the promised land. And so he sends prophets there, Ezekiel and Daniel especially. And then when they do get returned, there are prophets who are like, okay guys, you're back. Let's get our act together and straighten up and do this right now. So all of them speaking for God. Questions about any of that? Ezra and Nehemiah were not prophets, obviously. No. But they were in the writings. They they wrote. They're uh, they're in they're they're part of the collection of the writings. Okay. Because the focus there, it's not seen that they are responsible for prophetic. It's not like Ezra uh, or Nehemiah. Uh, Haggai is the one that God speaks through His Word to say, build the temple. Ezra is inspired to go and lead it. Nehemiah is inspired to go and lead them in terms of building the wall. But it's like God gives them the assignment to go and do it, not go tell other, other people to do it, which is what he did with the prophets. Okay? Um, and so that they're not included in the prophetic literature. Again, I want to emphasize the fact that most of these prophets, you can tell from just the description, or if you've read them, are not talking about something that's coming in the future. Most of them are talking about what's happening right now. God is saying to you, Northern Kingdom of Israel, Southern Kingdom of Judah, Israelites. This is how you're acting wrong now. This is how you need to change now. And we need to understand that almost all of the prophets were speaking to the present moment and God's will for the people right now. There are a few examples where God does have them speak to the future because God doesn't, you know, God's not limited to a single time. Ever since the start of creation, God had been involved in a process of working out his plan for humanity since the very start. Sometimes that involves, most of the time with the prophets, involves dealing with right now. Sometimes it said, by the way guys, here's, here's, here's where we're going in the future. And you need to look forward to this and straighten yourself up now in order to get there. So sometimes there was prophetic stuff. But prophecy, again, is not just God's telling God's having somebody tell the future. It's dealing with the present situation, and especially sometimes the present situation that will lead to a predictive future. So we need to be clear on that. Ross? Yes? Uh, the seventh century prophets, were they in the north or the south? All of them would have been in the south, because by that time period, the north had been destroyed. You know, the range of time period for that is 675 to 597. The northern kingdom was destroyed in 722. So they didn't even, they're all at this point talking to the south. The southern kingdom of Judah. And it gets very confusing that the northern kingdom was called Israel, just like the combined kingdom had been. But I think you guys have got that, right? 
All right, let's, this, this gives you a rough chronology. And I say rough because I don't think all of the dates on here are necessarily correct. <coughs> this is out of uh, the Binware book. And I think it's valuable to have a sort of a visual guide to how things connected. When I say, I don't think Obadiah was this early, for instance. I think Obadiah was over here. Uh, and you'll see that on the charts, the, the charts, the list that I just showed you. But you get Assyria as being one of the major powers here. And then, uh, in the early uh, 600s, Babylon took over and lasted for less than 100 years. And, and this was actually the second Babylonian king. The Babylon had had a time before that. And then you get Persia coming along and taking over. So these were the great um, empires and kingdoms that were the powerhouses of the time period in the eastern, uh, Near Eastern world, the Eastern Mediterranean. This is the time period from 1000 BC to 400 BC. And you can see Jonah and Nahum, um, where they fall. So all of these names, you just compare it to this center line, and you can see about where, according to Benware, and I don't agree with all of his dates, but mostly it's right. Um, he's got Obadiah much earlier than I would. But I mentioned to you that the northern kingdom of Israel, after the split kingdom in 931, Amos and Hosea were prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel. In the southern kingdom, uh, the uh, kingdom of Judah, you've got Joel first, then Micah, Isaiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah. Daniel put parentheses around because Daniel is not considered a prophet in the Old Testament linking, and you know, uh, the way they break it out. Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi was the last of the prophets in the 5th century, you know, early 400s, up until early 400s. That gives you some idea, not only who was in power, what time, what the dates were, and but where they, uh, where they prophesied to as well, Israel or Judah. And I think it's valuable to be able to see some indication of that. And he's even got the asterisks, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and according to the Western view, Daniel are all considered major prophets because they have a lot of big books. All right, any question about that? This is in your book, so you can refer back to it. He's got a couple of other charts in there as well that kind of lay out the relationship, um, who they were, which kings they were under, who they were prophesying to, and all that sort of stuff. In fact, uh, let me jump ahead to one thing here. Here's another chart for you. I mentioned the oral prophets, or the non-writing prophets, and there were a number of those. The two most famous ones are listed on here. Elijah and Elisha. Both of them prophesied to Israel um, in the north. And that's the, there were more of the non-writing prophets that prophesied to Israel, and that's why God had given them so much of a chance that when it came to the period of the writing prophets, there were only two, Amos and Hosea, because the northern kingdom was so bad, they pretty much worn out um, any effort to try to convince them otherwise before the, the, we get the prophets who were writing, who were told to write down their message. So Elijah and Elisha, Elijah being one of the truly great prophets, uh, under these kings, Ahab, um, uh, Azaziah, Ahaziah, Joram, uh, Jehu, and uh, Jehoahaz, and then the approximate dates and where they were born, in case you ever want to go visit their birthplace. <laughs> I don't think we know exactly where some of them were. Some of them identify themselves. You know, Elijah is called Elijah the Tishbite, so we know where he came from, for instance. Then you get the major literary prophets, or the major prophets that actually wrote stuff, which means the ones with long books. They are Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, all of them to uh, the nation of Judah. In the case of Ezekiel, he's writing to the people of Judah, of the tri two tribes of Judah, Judah and uh, Ephraim, but while they're in exile in Babylon. Okay? And other information, this is all, you can, you can look at this chart on the, the web if you download this stuff. And then these are the 12 prophets who were the minor literary prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They go from the 700s, um, as you'll see, Amos probably was a little bit earlier, um, down to the mid to uh, early 400s in the case of Malachi. All of them had very specific kinds of uh, missions, calls. As I've said to you before, whereas we say there, um, there are 39 books in the Old Testament, the Jews have 24 books in the Hebrew Bible. It's exactly the same material, but they divide it up differently. 
They've got one book called the Book of Kings, not First and Second Kings. One book called the Book of Samuel, not First and Second Samuel. One book called Chronicles, not First and Second Chronicles. Ezra and Nehemiah, which tell sort of two halves of the same story, are one. And these twelve minor prophets are all one book called the Book of the Twelve. So their twenty-four books in the Hebrew Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, are exactly the same content as our thirty-nine books in the English Bible. Western Bible, but we break it up differently. Okay? Now, backing up one step here, the two categories I mentioned already of the latter prophets are the major prophets, the ones that are long, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Now, for the sake of argument, because I'm going to talk about this a uh, few minutes after we take a break, I've got Isaiah was in the 700s, but some scholars would say that Isaiah was pre-exilic, the first 39 chapters, meaning he wrote before the exile into Babylon, which happened in, in, uh, in 586. Some say that he wrote during the exile, some, which is the, the middle chapters, chapters 40 to 55. And then there are other scholars who take a third uh, cut and say that he's writing post-exile, 56 to 66. Well, since he clearly could not have been writing from the 700s until the 500s, um, and, you know, early 500s, then they claim there's more than one writer. I'm going to talk about that after the break. It gives you something to look forward to. This comes back to that, you know, second book of second Isaiah, uh, Isaiah or even third Isaiah. There are some scholars who have said there are five or six Isaiahs who wrote that book. I'm going to talk about why I don't think so. Then you get Jeremiah, who wrote 627 to 587. He was pre-exilic right up until he wrote 587 is one year before the fall of the southern kingdom of Judah. And so he was immediately right, he was present when that happened. And probably was carried off into exile as well. But his prophecy, the book of Jeremiah, is talking right up until the time in which that occurred. And then you get Ezekiel, who um, again would have been part of that taking into captivity and taking into exile, but the writing that we have was done after they were taken away into Babylon, and it has to do with the conduct of the people in Babylon, right? Then the Minor Prophets, or the Book of the Twelve, you get uh, Hosea, was one of the two Minor Prophets writing to the Northern Kingdom of Israel, pre-exilic, and it's regarding the unfaithfulness of Israel, very targeted kind of message. Joel is to the Southern Kingdom of Judah, it's post-exile. Judgment is approaching, symbolized by locusts. The book of Joel is all about, you know, God will sweep in and destroy you like locusts coming in to destroy food, you know, the crops. Amos, from the 760s and 750s in Israel, the northern kingdom, again, Hosea, Amos, the two northern kingdom prophets. Pre-exile against the injustices in the northern kingdom. Amos was more concerned about the fact that the people were living so well, the rich people were living so well, and they were doing it because they were being unjust to the poor. So Amos is a great book about um, social justice. It's a book that's often quoted with regard to the responsibility that people of means have to people who are poor, rather than taking advantage of their poverty, working them and not paying them enough, etc. Amos is a book about righteousness in terms of your conduct with other people. <coughs> Obadiah in the 500s, some of these are fairly general because we don't have an exact date. Joel or Obadiah, for instance, uh, and then some of them were very specific, like Habakkuk 606 is the date that's pretty much agreed upon. Um, Obadiah writing to Judah, the southern kingdom, during the exile, um, an oracle against Edom. Edom was one of the nations that had done Israel wrong when they were entering the promised land, and this... The Obadiah is one book which specifically is against the nation of Edom. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the rest of this stuff. Some of them are really are quite interesting in terms like Nahum. Again, a short book. It's rejoicing at the fall of Nineveh. When Assyria is overthrown or destroyed by Babylon, Nahum's book is a prophetic book celebrating the fact that Assyria has been destroyed. Um, it's, it, you know, he's loving the fact that... Now, God... You know, God loves all people, and he loves the Assyrians. He loved the Assyrians, too. In fact, the book of Jonah, which is quite unique, Jonah is not written in a prophetic style. He's considered a prophet because he was sent on a prophetic mission in Nineveh, but the way the book is written is like a short story. It has to do with Jonah being called by God to go to Nineveh, which was the capital city of Assyria. Not Susa. Nineveh. <laughs> 
Um, and he doesn't want to go because like all the rest of the people, like Nahum, he doesn't like the Assyrians. The Assyrians have, have been cruel, they were harsh, they were, they were a rough bunch of folk, he didn't want to mess with them. God says, Jonah, I want you to go to the Ninevites in the capital city of Assyria and preach to them. And Jonah goes, no way. So he gets on a boat and tries to go as far away as he can, what we today consider modern day Spain, which is a long way away in that time period. And of course, you know, the boat has problems. They end up identifying that Jonah has been disobedient to God. They throw him overboard. He gets swallowed by a fish that gets vomited up on land, has a vision. God sends him to Nineveh. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches. The people are converted to a belief in the one true God. And Nineveh, I mean, and Jonah is so ticked off about it, he stops his little feet and says, Talk on it. I didn't want these people to follow the one true God. And he's mad about it. Okay? And, that's, you know, and then God sort of corrects him. And that's how the book ends. So it's not written in terms of hearing what Jonah's prophetic message was. It's a short story kind of narrative telling about him going there as a prophet from God. So it's a unique kind of story. But it's an example of the fact that God had concern for the Ninevites too, for the, the Assyrians as well. But because apparently they converted for a while and then fell back into their own ways, worshiping other gods, etc., etc., then you get uh, Nahum, which comes about 100 years later, uh, celebrating, rejoicing over the fall of the Assyrian Empire and the destruction of Nineveh. Okay? Um, again, in all of these, every one of them has some particular kind of twist. Hosea, for instance, is, in, in order to visually represent or practically represent to the northern kingdom of Israel just how awful they have been, they have been in their relationship to God, uh, Hosea is ordered by God to marry a prostitute as a, as a practical example of what it's like to be in a relationship with someone who is unfaithful to you, which God was with the, with the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel. So Hosea is told to marry Gomer, who is a prostitute, and she continues to be unfaithful to him and run off. And she has children, and um, Hosea gives the children these terrible names. Like, you know, no longer my people, you know, it translates into that and, and that sort of thing. As a practical example, you get other examples, uh, Jeremiah, major prophet, where to prophesy that God will put the yoke of the Babylonians on the Israelites if they don't uh, shape up and obey, Jeremiah goes around wearing a, an ox, a yoke of an oxen as a visual uh, illustration of the fact that God will put the yoke of a foreign power on the, on the people of Judah if they don't straighten up. And there are a number of other ways in which God uses these sort of uh, practical, real life, either visual examples or lifestyle examples in the lives of the prophets in order to try to manifest his will and make the people listen. Uh, so they're fascinating things. Any questions about any of that? We're going we're gonna to break that down a little bit more as we go along here. I want to I spend some time looking at the major prophets and, uh, individually and then talk about the minor prophets kind of a general sweep. Any questions about any of that? There's a, this is a very hard one because there's a huge amount of material here, okay? And, and I know, it's, I can see it in your eyes, it's pretty hard to follow all this stuff. So, um, for those of you whose eyes I can still see. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's take a break. I've got five minutes till, I'll give you a ten minute break. Let's come back at five minutes after. The, but here, they identify fairly minor differences in style and say there's an indication from that that it was a different writer. But I think appropriately, critics have said you can apply that same rule to Shakespeare because some of his writing is of one style and some is of another style. And you, could, you could argue that Shakespeare didn't write all of his stuff because of that. And, 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 and any writer that's written more than one thing, you almost could use this. So that argument really doesn't hold that people have come to reject that. Instead, we recognize that there are certain characteristics that are consistent all the way through Isaiah. For instance, Isaiah has um, a reference to God as the Holy One of Israel. That is a unique mark in Isaiah, that he calls God, the great God Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. And that's consistent all the way through it. All the way through Isaiah, he uses that reference. We have the fact that throughout the entire Old Testament, after Isaiah, in the New Testament, 
and through the whole tradition since Isaiah, the Jews and you know into the into modern times, has been a standing tradition that Isaiah, you know Isaiah the prophet that we have, uh, the son of Amos, was responsible for writing this whole thing. And the fact that the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are a couple of books where that in the Dead Sea Scrolls where they where they suggest that some more than one author may have been responsible for some things. Or may have been edit. They may have had an editor that came back and added the things. The Book of Isaiah that they don't have that. The Book of Isaiah is one scroll, and nowhere in Dead Sea Scrolls or any other source other than modern scholars has anybody suggested down through history that there was more than one author. So the reasons that are given for uh, the Book of Isaiah being being written by two or three or five or seven people really don't hold up. If you believe that there can be something supernatural in Scripture, that this is the Word of God, <coughs> anti-supernaturalism is anti-theism at the end of the day. Which means if you don't believe that, that you can have anything that's supernatural in God's Word or in God's actions or in the work of the Holy Spirit or even today in the church, if you don't believe that there are angels and demons, if you don't believe that there's more than just a physical, visual world, by definition that means you can't really believe in God. And so we can't accept that as an argument, and yet every other argument falls aside. The reference to Cyrus very likely may have been that God gave that name to the writer of Isaiah in order for that to be a tool later to have that king of Persia send the Jews back to their homeland. All right? But that, that is the argument. That's why people say that they think there were multiple writers. The traditional view, and the one I agree with, is that there was one writer, Isaiah, the son of Amos, the one that traditionally, down through history, uh, is credited with writing all 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah. Bill? How many years had they been in Babylon when Persia took over? Not long. Um, from 586 to the 550s, so it was less than 30 years. I think that's right. I'd have to go back and, uh, and look at the exact date on that, but I think it was in the 550s. So. Da Daniel was there for four kings. Two of Babylon and two of, of Persia. That's true. So, you know, they were there for a good while. Well, but see, da Daniel, not years, everybody went back. Right. In fact, they went back in waves. The first group, and they even talk about that in Ezra and Nehemiah, they talk about, okay, the first group that went, and when Nehemiah is back, you know, is, is in Babylon, um, his brother comes. And his brother had apparently been part of the first group that went, and his brother's reporting to Nehemiah at the, the first chapter of the book of Nehemiah and saying, Nehemiah says, how's it going there, over there, that you guys have gone back to Jerusalem? And, he, and his brother says, not so good. Because they're working on rebuilding the temple, but the wall of the city is torn down, and so they're not protected, it's not a city anymore, it's kind of, it, it seems, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but it, it seems kind of ridiculous to be building the temple, rebuilding the temple, when there's nothing to protect it, there's no city there. And so it was at that point that Nehemiah, receives instructions from God that he's the one that's supposed to go back and rebuild the wall. As Ezra and Zerubbabel, who was the, who was the governor, were responsible for rebuilding the temple. So this happened in waves. And some people, like Daniel, never returned. I mean, they, they God's instruction to them, or for whatever reason, they continued to make their home until their death in Babylon. And slowly the people kind of filtered back. But a lot of people never went back. And that's why we have the stories like of Daniel being an old man and still in Babylon. Okay. Where, where was the seven? They were there for seventy years, right? In yeah. Babylon. What, what, were they were they captured? It, it, I have like seventy I have years to, in Babylon. I have to look. I think that it was when, when Bill's question about returning. I think that from five eighty six to the five fifties was when they first went back. Was when they were defeated. Now, how long some of the others stayed in Babylon? I don't know. I have to look. But the, it, they were prophesied to stay there. They would be there for like 70 years. Is that right? Uh, it, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. And my thinking was, when when did this whole process, is, is that 70 years when it, they began to go back? Or was that, right. you know, when they the last ones that would go back went back? Or I was just, Yeah, I'll look up when, you know. Not important. I'll, 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 I mean, but it's, it's interesting. We want to, you know, this is history. And we want to know. I will look up when the actual fall of, uh, actually, I think we had Um, okay, Babylon, you've got 550, was when Persia defeated Babylon. It continued to exist for a little while longer as a nation, but it was not a power. 
Persia is marked as having ascended when they defeated Babylon. So from 586 to 550, you've got 36 years there between the time that the, um, the, they were taken off into captivity and they returned. That, but they, you know, that's when they started returning, because only the first of them, uh, Cyrus, in the first year of his reign, gave them permission to go back, but they didn't all go back. They went back, in fact, the reason that uh, Haggai writes his book is because the people go back and they start to rebuild the temple and then they get busy with other stuff and don't do it. So he comes along and goes, you, you guys better get back to work. And they went two years in between when they started it and then stopped before they went back and finished it. So there's, there's stuff happening all in there. 550 is not like it's the date that everybody went back. They continued and some of them never returned. They stayed in, in Babylon. Okay. So is that what you're looking for, Bill? And, yeah. Okay. Go forward here again. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the book of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of King Uzziah, who became king in 790, through the reigns of Jotham. Ahaz, and then Hezekiah. And as I say, Hezekiah was the king, a good king, who really was righteous and, and, and served the Lord, who refused to give in to the Assyrians when they were camped outside the city of Jerusalem and threatening to destroy it. Now, this is pretty significant. I mean, uh, this would be like Ahihik deciding they were going to, um, in those days, Ahihik deciding that, okay, we built a wall around ourselves and we're going to refuse to give in to the United States of America because they're trying to take us over. It's, the city of Jerusalem at that point was not a power. Jerusalem was not powerful. Um, it was the southern kingdom was separated. They didn't have. They weren't like they had been a kingdom under David or Solomon. They were very isolated, a small people at this point. And Assyria was everything. Assyria was the world power at this point in time. Hezekiah says, "No, we're not going to do this because God has sent the word to me." especially through the prophet Isaiah, that we're not supposed to give in, so we won't. So this is a big deal, the fact that uh, Hezekiah listened to Isaiah and did not give in. Becky, a question, a comment? He said that he, was, he prophesied during King Uzziah, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Um, Uzziah, Jotham. Uzziah? Uzziah, U-Z-Z-I-A-H. Oh, okay. Jotham, J-O-T-H-A-M, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And it was Sennacherib was the king of Assyria during the time of Hezekiah. That's the one that they uh, Hezekiah refused to get into, and then they awoke one morning to find themselves dead. Is sort of how the King James <laughs> says it. Apparently, there was a plague, and enough the the Assyrian soldiers died that they turned and left and went back to Assyria. Um, and so that's why they lasted longer. But unfortunately, when Hezekiah, the good king of Judah, died, his son Manasseh took over. He was a horrible king, returned them to all of the pagan worship, and legend has it, it is only legend, a Jewish legend, that uh, Isaiah was the prophet was killed by Manasseh because he, he tried to be the same prophet of Manasseh that he, who was evil, that he was to his, good, his father who was a good man, Hezekiah, and the story is that Isaiah was put inside a log and sawed in half inside a log uh, by Manasseh, his people. So. Um, he came to a bad end, according to tradition, but we don't know that for a fact. Right? I mentioned the fact that Isaiah is the book of salvation. The key word in this is salvation, and God wishes to save, and he will. And that includes both immediately, he wishes to save the southern kingdom of Judah, but also we read these as prophecies of God's intention to save eventually and ultimately through the promised one, the Messiah, who will come. And again, that's why we use all of those verses at Christmas time. Verses like, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. That's from Isaiah 7, 14. Um, and this one, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne. See, this is a fulfillment of the promise to King David. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah 9. Uh, Isaiah 53 is one of the areas, what we call the suffering servant passages. 
that we, in hindsight, understand this to be predictions about the suffering of Jesus on our behalf. Isaiah 53, starting with the fourth verse, says, Surely our griefs he, griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. And it goes on. And we clearly see that today as uh, prophetic about the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise in the Messiah, who was Jesus, which doesn't happen for 700 years after this was written. Okay. Um, the major sections, in terms of outline, let me go back, for Isaiah, he starts out with prophecies of uh, condemnation in the first 35 chapters. Remember I said the sort of law and judgment part? Uh, first, the first 12 chapters are prophecies against the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah. Then from chapters 13 to 23, he deals with prophecies against Gentile nations, the surrounding nations. That include the nation of Babylon, of Assyria, of Philistia, Moab, um, Damascus, and her ally Israel, the northern kingdom um, ally. Ethiopia, Egypt, Babylon, Edom, Arabia, Jerusalem, and Tyre, all of these different um, Gentile nations, there are prophecies against them. Then we have prophecies of the day of the Lord. Uh, prior to these prophets, the day of the Lord was referred to some earlier in Scripture, and usually the Jews thought that was a good thing, that the day of the Lord would be a day of blessing and of grace and of wonderful things. Well, it continued to have that meaning, but um, starting particularly with Isaiah, the day of the Lord started taking on a dark side as well. In uh, the 24th chapter of Isaiah, he talks about the day of the Lord as a judgment and a tribulation, that it would be a time of uh, judgment, tribulation, of uh, God punishing for evil doing in the day of the Lord, but then out of that would come triumph and blessing. So the day of the Lord started taking a dark turn here in terms of the interpretation by the prophets. He then goes on in uh, chapter 28 to 35 to talk about specifically prophecies against Judah and an echoing of prophecies against Israel. In chapter 36 to 39, he has prophecies against Sennacherib. Sennacherib was the king of the Assyrians, and he actually taunts them and threatens them and talks about all the things God will do against Sennacherib. And then from 40 to 66 are the prophecies of comfort and consolation that Israel will be delivered and the great God will be the source of that delivery and salvation will occur through the one God has chosen, the suffering servant, that passage I just read from 53, and that Israel will have a glorious future and God will guarantee them peace. The vision that we have for heaven, for the fulfillment in the, uh, the last days. Any questions about Isaiah? Yes, Michael. As far as authorship goes, when you say one single author, is it also possible that being from a prominent family and being so prominent during this time that he had a team of writers and delegated, and therefore we have the discrepancies that some people wish to argue against? Well, the discrepancies people claim is that People wrote this 200 years after he was dead, so that would have been a team of people he had. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm glad you said that because it brings me back around to something. We have to be careful that, let's say for a minute, for the sake of argument, that someone else, some other prophet, did come back and edit Isaiah's writing, but still under anointing by God, from direction by God, added stuff to it for the sake of, you know, of furthering. God's revelation. There's nothing inherently uh, problematic about that from a point of view of faith. You know, Isaiah wasn't the only one that got anointed. God could have anointed somebody else to come along and do that. Um, the, so it's not the idea that someone else may have added to the book of Isaiah that's a problem for us. The problem comes if people say it couldn't have been written by one person because it can't be supernatural. In other words, if their arguments are God isn't really God and he can't do miraculous stuff, then, you would, then we have a problem with it. But if it meant, and this is the same with the book of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, uh, books of Moses, 
as I said, it, it, it seems to be likely that Joshua, probably Joshua, or someone else that was anointed by God, went back into the writings that Moses was primarily responsible for and, and filled in some blanks, added some stuff in order to connect it together, to make it flow, whatever. The places where Moses is spoken of in the third person may be that. The places where it says, you know, and, and um, Moses is the greatest man that's ever been, even up until the current day. Well, that expression doesn't make any sense unless it was written sometime after Moses, right? So it may very well be that by God's anointing, somebody else went in and added bits, but still Moses is the primary author. And we credit Moses as being the one God inspired to give us the, the, the bulk of it, but somebody else may have made some additions or edits or smoothing out or whatever. Again, by God's anointing. The same thing could be true with Isaiah. When I say I believe it's one author, I don't accept the arguments that the scholars, the liberal scholars, make for why it can't have been one writer. Because those don't seem valid to me. If somebody did, by God's, by God's direction, I don't have any heartburn for that. Is that fair? Becky. Um, I was wondering, um, like, in the time of Jesus, where they had references of Jesus in other books, like Josephus and in other writings right. that were not biblical. Are there any uh, references in my uh, records of the kingdom of Isaiah in other books um, at that time? Or I can't. Know? I can't quote them, but I'm quite sure it's true. And the reason I say it's quite sure it's true because I know that Sennacherib, for instance, we have the chronicles during the time when Sennacherib was king. We have the account that he was. One of the things that uh, that Isaiah says about him is that you know you'll. You, you won't survive your own family kind of stuff. And he, he ended up being assassinated by his sons after he went back to, to Nineveh. And so um, my guess is Isaiah was such an, and I don't know this for a fact, but because we have records from the Assyrian kingdom, from Nineveh and Sennacherib spoken about a lot, my guess is there, it's very possible, I don't know, I'd have to look, I don't know all this stuff that um, they may have mentioned the fact that they had this troublemaker on their hands named Isaiah, and he's the one that's causing Hezekiah to act up, you know, kind of stuff. Not flattering, I'm sure. But I, I, would, I would guess that with some of these prophets who were major figures, that we probably could find uh, other references to them, because we do have extra-biblical documents from that time period, quite a few of them, as a matter of fact. It'd be interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I'll, I'll see if I can find some on that. Anything else? Questions or comments? Isaiah's a good one. Um, now, Isaiah's not easy to sit down and just read through. In fact, when Carolyn and I got married, we decided we were going to have Bible study together. We sat down and started reading, and we thought, well, let's take the prophet Isaiah. He's one of the foremost of the prophets. And we decided that Isaiah could be called the dyslexic prophet, because <laughs> you'll be reading along, and then he'll do a head fake on you, and a, a verse that's completely out of context, and you're going to, hold up. What's that? And it's very hard because it's not historical. He's not giving accounts of events. He's, you know, it's a thus saith the Lord. And so some of these messages are kind of disjointed. So it's hard to sit down and read Isaiah from first of chapter 1 to the end of chapter 66 and get a flow. That's why usually when we, we read Isaiah, we have these verses that are taken out of context, like unto us a child is born, you know, unto us a son is given. Because... If you the context is really good, but you have to understand that Isaiah is not easy reading material in terms of going from point A, you know, from A to Z. It's from A to J to B to Q to you know kinds of stuff because he was. Remember, I said earlier that one of the marks of the prophets was they ecstatic. In other words, they, they gave themselves over to control by God. And you get the feeling when you're reading Isaiah that Isaiah is recording this stuff as the Holy Spirit's giving it to him, and even he may not have understood the connection between all of it doesn't mean it's less valid, it just means it's not the easiest book to sit down and study in order. I'm, I, in fact, my, my Bible reading, I'm in Isaiah now, and it jumps around a whole lot. Okay. So. All right, let's talk about the prophet Jeremiah, the second of the major prophets, who, um, second of the two, three major, of the three major prophets that are part of the latter prophets. Jeremiah wrote between 627 and 585 B.C. And by the way, you'll notice I have a couple of different dates. One other place I said 587. We don't know exactly. That's what the C means, circa. And probably if you see different dates on these, it's because I'm using multiple mat reference materials. And unless there's a, a great difference, I'm liable to have a two-year difference in there because it's about. 
circa means about. But we do know that he was writing immediately to the southern kingdom of Judah, immediately prior to the, uh, the devastation by Babylon on the southern kingdom of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. Now, it's also true that what happened with the southern kingdom of Jerusalem is, or the southern kingdom of Judah and the city of Jerusalem, is that the Babylonians actually defeated uh, Judah ten years earlier in the 590s, but they didn't destroy the city. And as often happened, they, you know, they took the city and then they said, okay, you guys have to pay us tribute and you have to, you know, you have to be a vassal power, you know, you, you report to us now and we get half your stuff and that kind of thing. Well, that was fine for about 10 years and then um, Judah and Jerusalem rebelled against that, thought they would get uppity and fight back and then it was in 586 that Babylon came in and completely destroyed them, all right, and destroyed the city destroyed the temple, the whole thing. That's why they had to come back later and rebuild it after exile. Okay. So, in this book, as with Isaiah, we have a very clear identification of the author. This is Jeremiah, who's identified as the son of Hilkiah, from the priest city of Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. This is what I was talking to you about, Michael, is that, is that in the same way Samuel, Samuel's father is said to be a Benjamite, and yet he became a priest. Well, the cities... The, the priestly cities or the Levitical cities existed inside or in, in the interior of various other tribal lands. And this is, a, this is one of those cases where the city of Anathoth was a Levitical city, a city of Levites, but it existed inside the area that was owned by the tribe of Benjamin. Okay? And so that's why they could say in the case of Samuel, his father was a Benjamite and not be inconsistent with the fact that he was also a Levite because they lived inside Benjamin but he was Levitical. Same thing is true here with Isaiah, or I'm sorry, with Jeremiah. <clears throat> Jeremiah did not himself write down his um, prophecies. He's, we'd say he's one of the writing prophets, but all of this stuff originally was oral. And in the case of Jeremiah, Jeremiah had been prophesying for many years before God finally told him, all right, I want you to write this down, write this in a scroll. And Jeremiah had a scribe, he had a secretary named Baruch, we, we know him by name from, from, from the book. And Baruch wrote this stuff down. In fact, he wrote it all down, and then the kings took it all away from him, arrested them, threw him in jail, burned. took the stuff and burned it. And so they had to come back later and Baruch rewrote this stuff. Okay, so we, it was written twice. Uh, Jeremiah is, a, is kind of a sad case. He's been called the weeping prophet. He's also known as the prophet of loneliness. God commanded him not to marry. And again, as a sign of sort of desolation because of the failure of Judah to be obedient to God. Uh, another one of those places where God gives instructions to do something visible in your life as a symbol of uh, how the people have treated God. He, in the first chapter, is identified as being reluctant. He didn't really want to be a prophet of God. God called him anyway and told him he needed to do this. And he then, after agreeing, he was faithful to proclaim God's judgment but again, this was the worst time in the history of the southern kingdom of Judah, right up until the time when God had to destroy, use Babylon to destroy them. And so um, Jeremiah was not well received. Part of his being the weeping prophet is that he was arrested, he was opposed, he was arrested, he was beaten. Um, he had a rough go of it. He was not a prophet that everybody said, whoa, isn't he great? Um, he had a, a, a very difficult time of the whole thing. Jeremiah was a contemporary of a number of the minor prophets, of Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and two of the major prophets, Daniel and Ezekiel, because his time period crossed over. He lived over into the exilic period. His writing was right up into the time of the exile, but he lived through the exile. So he lived during the time of Daniel and Ezekiel, as well as Zephaniah and Habakkuk, who were minor prophets who were prophesying to specific situations. Um, the, his, the title of the book, which is taken from his name, literally means, we believe, Jehovah established, that, that Jehovah or God set in place. But there's some argument about that. Some people believe that Ezekiel, the, the word Ezekiel and the name Ezekiel means God exalts. And some people believe, have interpreted this, because remember, as I've said before, we don't, we don't know exactly how some Hebrew words are, are to be translated, especially words that are common names. Carolyn? I'm sorry, uh, Jeremiah. What am I talking about? It's Jeremiah. 
I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Okay. Jeremiah, it means, some people say Jehovah established, some people say it means the Lord exalts, uh, and some people, some scholars say that it means the Lord throws, like tosses, hur hurls, because of the suggestion either that, that, that as a prophet Jeremiah was hurled into the hostile world, or that Jeremiah had hurled the nations in divine judgment. Um, Samuel, would you go and infest our people mowing? Would you ask them to wait until their class is over another 20 minutes? Mowing is Oh, is that what it is? I thought maybe they did start doing something here. Okay, good, thanks. So the main theme is a warning of God's judgment against sin, that the judgment is, pre, is, is imminent, that it's about to come on, come on them, it's going to be a, a, a harsh judgment. But also, as with many of the prophets, as I said, it's not all doom and gloom. There's also the sense in which there is a message of hope and restoration that if the nation repents, God would bless them. This is, as I said, the very last hour of Judah's failing. It's a time of backsliding and unfaithfulness and everything that's bad. And that's what Jeremiah is up against. And that's why he is so strongly opposed. People didn't want to hear this. There are a lot of verses that we probably could say were... Um, the representative verses for Jeremiah, but I picked Jeremiah 7. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. For when I brought your forefathers out of Egypt and spoke to them, I did not just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but I gave them this command, Obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Walk in all the ways I command you, that it may go well with you. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubborn in inclinations of their evil hearts, they went backward and not forward. From the time your forefathers left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you, my servants, the prophets. But they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did more evil than their forefathers. Therefore say to them, this is the nation that has not obeyed the Lord its God or responded to correction. Truth has perished. It has vanished from their lips. Cut off your hair and throw it away. Take up a lament of the barren heights, for the Lord has rejected and abandoned this generation that is under his wrath. The people of Judah have done evil in my eyes, declares the Lord. This was the message that Jeremiah was told to present to the people of Israel. Um, in terms of outline, the first chapter is entirely the call and commission of Jeremiah. And again, he was reluctant. Verse 6, he says he doesn't want to do it. But God calls him, and he, he obeys. Then we have chapters 2 through 45 are prophecies to Judah, first about the condemnation of Judah, that uh, it recognizes that they are guilty of willful sin, they will be chastened, they have a wrong religion, they are breaking God's covenant, that there will be a drought coming upon them, and on and on. Okay, you, get the, you get the picture. Then you have a, the conflict that Jeremiah has from chapter 26 to 29, where they're fighting him and arresting him and beating him and doing all this stuff. Then starting with chapter 46, you have the prophecies to the Gentile nations. There are prophecies against Egypt, the Philistines, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Damascus, well, actually Syria through the capital of Damascus, Arabia, Elam, and Babylon. And then you have the, the uh, fate of Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem and the exile into Babylon. Okay? That's the outline for the book of Ezekiel. Any questions? Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ezekiel, Ezekiel comes later. Okay. Yes, Bob. Why would he prophesy to the non Gentile nations? And why would they even listen to him? Well, um, and the same thing was true with Isaiah. Isaiah also had, and it's not so much a prophecy, uh, much of it is a prophecy too, just saying, you're going to get yours. But a lot, but he's doing that almost more for the people who are hearing him in Judah. The reason I think that both Isaiah and Jeremiah do that is because God always wanted to make sure that everybody kept in mind that he was the God of everybody. He was the God of all creation. He was the God of all peoples. And when he's speaking a word of judgment specifically to Israel, you get cases in Isaiah and Jeremiah where he says, but don't forget, I am not overlooking the evil that is being done by the non-Jewish peoples as well, these other nations. And so, and they're not long. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't spend nearly as much time or detail on that, but it's, got, it's God's way of saying through, especially Isaiah and Jeremiah, 
Um, and, and later on, I mean, like you get Ob uh, Obadiah, whose whole prophecy is against Edom, that I'm not overlooking the fact that even though you're not my chosen people, you too have chosen to do evil. You too are doing things that are wrong. And I will not let that pass. The time will come. Okay. So it's, it's sort of a secondary footnote kind of thing, but he wants to make sure that everybody, including the people of Israel, or the people of Judah, uh, the Israelites, know he is the God of everybody. But they especially are his, his focused because they have been his chosen people. You know, he gave them every, every blessing, every opportunity, and they have not listened. John? A comment. Um, when I read Jeremiah, I'm impressed with the fact that truth has a price tag. Mm -hmm. And when I look at this man who loved Ju Jerusalem, he loved, he loved the temple, he loved his people, but they wouldn't listen to him. And he was commissioned by God to give them a message which he suffered greatly because he was faithful to that. And at one point, they, they take him and, and they tell him this isn't of God. And they, they uh, bring him before the king and they're about to kill him. And, and Jeremiah says, look, this is all I can tell you. This is what the Lord says. Now with me, you can do whatever you want. Right. But, this, but if you kill me, innocent blood's going to be on your hands. And what strikes me about that is the day in which we live. And there's such a, a deviation from truth and such a pursuit of carnal pleasures and, the, and that sort of thing. And, and the cost for, for living and declaring truth as a 21st century Christian is getting more and more expensive. And, and I think Jeremiah has a lot to say for us about courage, about integrity, about being faithful to the Word of God. Yeah, it's especially, I mean, for a long time it has been a heavy price to be paid if you were a Christian in many parts of the world. We got it easy. I mean, it could be ten times worse than it is right now on us, and we'd still have it easy compared to many parts of the world. So, yeah, and Jeremiah, you're exactly right. Jeremiah is a message to, to that very thing, that you respond to the truth and call of God, and you pay the price. But God is still there. God will not be mocked. God, you know, God is in charge. So and it's we, interesting, we remember his name. All the guys from Anaoth, his town where he yeah. came from, that raised those up against We don't know They're the names of the syndicate. Yeah. prophets, you know, but we know Jeremiah's name. He is right. remembered. Okay, let's spend a few minutes now and talk about finally <laughs> the book of Ezekiel. <laughs> okay, Ezekiel the prophet prophesied during the exile. This is when the Jewish people from the southern kingdom of Judah were in exile in Babylon. It's during the same time period as Daniel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that you read about in the book of Daniel. The theme is that the exile, it's sort of an explanation for the fact that the exile in Babylon is God's judgment, but that God will still restore the righteous if they will return to him. So it's a, a sense in which, yes, you're being judged, yes, you're being punished, but that punishment is not a forever punishment if you will return to the Lord. And especially because of the fact that a new generation had been born and, grow, and be, was beginning to grow up in Babylon who didn't know what it had been like to be part of a righteous nation under God in the Promised Land. Uh, Ezekiel is concerned to make sure that that new generation knows of the Lord and knows to seek the Lord and uh, what is required for restoration. Now, Ezekiel was a priest, the son of Buzi, we're told, and he received the call of the prophet during the exile in Babylon but because he was also a priest as well as prophet, in that regard he was like Samuel, uh, there is a strong priestly focus in Ezekiel. He talks a lot about the, the temple and the restoring of the temple, which happened later on, uh, under, uh, as we talked about under Ezra and Nehemiah. The restoring of the temple, the restoring of the priesthood, the restoring of the sacrificial system uh, as being something that would be a sign of restoration that the people should look to. As we said, he wrote uh, 593 to 571, so he bridged the... Um, 593 would have been after the initial defeat of Jerusalem by Babylon, and then right in the, right in the middle of that, 586, would have been when, when uh, Babylon destroyed, or the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, took the people off into captivity, and then his writing takes him into uh, 571, into the time of the actual exile. The name of the book... Um, Ezekiel is his proper name, uh, and it means God strengthens or strengthened by God. Again, that idea of restoration, of being uh, in the midst of punishment, to be strengthened by God and to be restored. His focus 
is twofold. As I said, condemnation for Israel's sin and, consul and the, the, the refusal to be obedient, but the consolation that would come. So you've got the call of Ezekiel in the first chapter, then judgment against Judah for the sin, a declaration that this is happening to you because of your own failing. Then, again, you get some of a judgment against the, uh, the Gentile nation. So all three of the major prophets have this. Against Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt, in the case of Ezekiel. And then, finally, you get the prophecy about restoration. So he starts with an explanation for why the judgment. He makes sure they understand that it's not just the Jews of Judah, of the nation of Judah, the uh, kingdom of Judah, that are being judged, that God will judge all for their unrighteousness, and then the promise of restoration that comes at the end. Um, there are some beautiful, beautiful passages in, in Ezekiel that deal with restoration. And you all probably know the story of the Valley of the Dry Bones. Ezekiel has this vision of this valley where there's nothing but these dead, dry bones. There's no life anywhere. And then the breath of God comes upon them and the bones take on life and they grow sinews and they grow flesh and they come to life again. This is one of the great visual representations that Ezekiel gives us for what God can do even with the brokenness of the a Jewish people who are in exile in a foreign land under domination by somebody else. Another passage that I think represents um, Ezekiel is from the 36th chapter. Ezekiel, speaking for God, says, For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries. Now this is not only, when we talk about restoration, this is not only restoring the Jews back to the promised land from Babylon, but from the whole world. God's promise is bigger than just two countries here. All right. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people, and I will be your God. That's the promise from Abraham on. You will be my people, and I will be your God. That's the promise that God keeps renewing to his people. And he says it here through Ezekiel. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful. will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. I be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, O house of Israel. In other words, I'm not doing this because you deserve it. I'm doing this because I promised you, and you are still my people. I still love you, and you need to turn around and be righteous, but it is. It, the things you have done that are evil would justify complete annihilation, would justify me destroying you, but I still love you. I still claim you as my people, and I will restore you, even though you don't deserve it. Okay? That's the message of Ezekiel. Any questions about that? Ezekiel the prophet. Okay? I want to spend about four minutes now <laughs> talking about the 12 minor prophets. I think I've given you all enough background on them already. I don't think I have. I'm going to go back up to the list so that you. Can you see that from back there? <coughs> okay, I'll go for this one. Um, the 12 minor prophets, the one book in the Hebrew Tanakh under the Nevi'im. Um, are consistent. I mean, each of them was given a specific assignment. They are much more targeted than the major prophets. They're, they're not as long. They're, their scope is not as broad. But still, they have certain consistencies. There are basic ingredients in every one of the prophetic statements. These pieces are in all of them. First, there, in every case, is a warning of impending judgment because of national sinfulness. Their second is a description of what the sin is, and it varies from prophet to prophet, but whatever the failing is, is identified. Third, there's a description of what the coming judgment will be, whatever the particular judgment for that prophet, from that prophet. 
Fourth, there is a call for repentance, to return to the way of the Lord. Um, and fifth, there then is a promise of future deliverance, if people pay attention and repent and return to the Lord. So, um, a warning of impending judgment, a description of the sin that's occurred, a description of the coming judgment because of that particular sin, a call for repentance, a promise of future deliverance. That formula is consistent in, in all the prophets, in one way or another. And we have a number of different literary forms that are used to fulfill that. Literary forms being, you know, literary forms that we know. There are novels, there are short stories, there are, you know, uh, journalistic articles. Those are literary forms. Well, in terms of the, the prophetic writing in the Minor Prophets, some of them are judgment speeches, which contain accusations and judgments. You've done this, and God is going to do this to you for it. You also have what's called the Woe Oracles. Woe, W-O-E. That's like a judgment um, speech, except it starts out with woe, woe unto you for having done the things you've done. We have exhortations or calls to repentance. We have salvation announcements in many cases. Like I say, the, the prophets are not all doom and gloom. There's also the positive side that they present. So salvation announcements or salvation oracles. So they're called oracles because usually they start with fear not. Um, Isaiah 41 is a good example of that. Fear not. Or God is doing a new thing. And then we have salvation portrayals, what it will look like down the road if they're obedient to God. So those, the minor prophets, um, the book of 12, are all consistent in terms of the kind of message. They're targeted to specific problems or specific areas. They, there may be a specific kind of sin or manifestation of sin, but all of them still are consistent that it's, it's God sending the prophets to warn against judgment because of sin, to identify the sin, to describe specifically what the judgment's going to be, to call for repentance and to promise future deliverance. And it's also helpful perhaps to think in terms of the fact that I gave you that timeline. You've got certain, the pre-exilic pre prophets, including the, the two prophets to the northern kingdom and the southern prophets, are during the rise and power of Assyria, and then you get the prophets of Judah um, that prophesied during the decline of Assyria and the rise of Babylon. And then you get the prophets that prophesy after the people are in exile in Babylon. So all of this, I simply mention that because all of this is um, occurred in a context in history that had to do especially with Assyria first and then Babylon and then later Persia when, when King Cyrus of Persia allowed the Jews to return. And so you get... Um, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi having to the prophets of the return. So all of these in the context of what God was allowing to happen historically through the other kingdoms in that part of the world. You, you call this the five what? The, uh, the, the, the five cycles? Uh, no, I, those would all be five basic elements or ingredients in, in the prophetic statements. Target Any? on specific what was it you said? What's that? They target on specific Sins? Sins? I, I think that's already used by a Well, yeah. you use sinfulness and, yeah. and judgment and repentance and future and deliverance. Um, the, yeah. Subjects? Okay. I was okay. Catching all Other questions or comments? We come to the end of our time. Any, any questions or comments about any of the major or the latter prophets, either the three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or the minor prophets? Would you read off those five points? Okay, the five points that, that you find in the prophets is one, a warning of impending judgment because of sin. So a warning. Second is a description of what the sin is in a particular case. Third, a description of the judgment that's coming because of the sin. Fourth, a call to repentance from the sin. And then fifth, a promise of future deliverance if they do repent. Those are the five pieces. And, the, and when you read the prophets, you can see those elements reflected. Whatever the particular circumstance, uh, the minor prophets especially are. Homework? Yes, homework. You have homework. Oops. I overshot the mark. Um, get it this way. Uh, reading assignment for next Monday would be in the Benware book, pages 159 to 185. It's not very much. It's the books of poetry and wisdom. So we're getting into the writings now, according to the Hebrew categories of the Tanakh. And I want you to read the book of Esther and the book of Ecclesiastes.
two very different books, both of whom are in the, the writings or uh, the Ketuvim section of the Tanakh. And this is online. You can this this slide is 